Uh, we have 34 people on, so I think we're approaching critical mass. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. So there's enough time at the end for people to ask questions. Um, so I'll just give you a quick introduction. Um, sure, sure. Everyone, thank you for joining the Empire Urology in-service review series this evening. Uh, I'm Alex Small, and I am very honored to be introducing uh, my friend and former mentor, uh, Dr. Stephen Brandis uh, from Columbia Urology. Uh, Dr. Brandis is really a world-renowned expert in urologic reconstructive surgery, and he is a professor at Columbia, where I did my training. Uh, before that, he was at uh, Wash U in St. Louis for many years, where he served as the residency program director. And in addition to all of that, he has extensively published in urology and really changed the way that we uh, treat many diseases in urology. If that's not enough, on top of that, uh, he's also heavily involved in AUA guidelines and exam, um, uh, the exam committee. So oh. if you uh, tune into any of our lectures, this is a great one for everyone to be tuning into. It's sure to be high yield, uh, especially these questions come up every single year on the in-service. So uh, Dr. Brandis, I'm going to turn it over to you. Very happy to have you doing an empire review for us this evening. Well, thank you, Alex, uh, for, for uh, <clears throat> uh, having the opportunity. Uh, uh, thank you for, for getting this all together. This is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of work and a lot of time, so thank you for doing it. I will say, just to, to, to say that, um, you know, who's this guy? He doesn't know what he's talking about. But uh, every year when I used to be residency director, I used to take the in-service exam, and I used to be the not the highest scoring uh, uh, f faculty, but I'd be in the middle. I was better than half the residents, at least on the in-service. So, uh, so all right. So, Alex, how do I get rid of? Uh, I like looking at your face and my face, but oh, let me close this little window. Okay, you I got can, it. You can close the little window. And by the yeah. way, uh, if anyone has any questions, please post them in the chat. We'll we'll go through them as the talk goes on or at the end. Uh, yeah, yeah. Miranda, so you can just keep going. I, I have a ton of stuff uh, to do, so who knows uh, if we can get through it. Okay, I'm, I'm going to start. Okay, so we're going to talk about kidney anatomy and an, uh, anatomical vasculature, and I'll try and make it more uh, practical. Can you, can you see the arrow, Alex? Uh, yep, we can see it. Okay, so look, here are the important uh, factors when, when uh, at least to an in-service exam. You know, on the right side, you know, the renal vein is very uh, short, and on the left side, it's long, and this is why, you know, kidney transplants and some of the are from the left side. But the key things here are the multiple branches that come off of the uh, 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 renal vein. One, you have your gonadal, but the key is the lumbar. So if you see a question that you're doing an nephrectomy and the patient's still bleeding, you take out the kidney, it's still bleeding, what's the, what's the answer on the insufficient exam? It's the lumbar veins. This is what's prob uh, problematic. Especially, you know, you could staple here distally, and then the renal vein is still, the, the, this vein is still bleeding. The next thing is that the adrenal vein is just a branch uh, off, while the adrenal vein, you'll see on the other side, is more, uh, it's right off the cava. So an injury, if they say, oh, you have a gunshot wound to the adrenal vein on the right side, that is a hole in the vena cava, that it is not, okay. Next thing is, you note that the adrenal vessels are just solitary, right? So there's one vein and three arteries. And here, and the key is that lymphatic drainage and if you know the anatomy, then you'll be familiar with, you'll know the answers, or you could guess the answers to many questions. So the right adrenal vein, you know, is a branch off of the cava, while the left adrenal vein is going into the renal uh, vein, you know, you have roughly in the middle. So if you say, look, I had a left testicular tumor, where is the primary landing site? Then here, Inferenal, this is the primary landing site, periaortic, inferenal. All you have to know is the anatomy, so you could guess. This side, if you have a testicular cancer, and you say, oh, what's the, where's the primary landing site? Well, the primary landing site is intraaortic cable, right, and pre-cable, because you know that the lymphatics in the, in the vein follow each other. 
So you can easily guess your answer. This is another thing saying, though they usually like to give you, a, they say there's a gunshot wound to the proximal renal vein here on the left. What do you do? Do you repair it? What do you do? No. The answer is you ligate it because there is sufficient collateral drainage through the lumbars and the gonadal. So the answer to a proximal ure uh, a renal vein transection injury is ligated. <laughs> How about the portal uh, veins in portal venous uh, system? So this is important to know because when you're doing surgery, but also what things drain. You know, the typical question they're asking is what drains different parts of the body, right? So here is the <clears throat> right colon and the appendix. And they may ask you, what drains the appendix? Well, you do, uh, you know, uh, you do a mace or you do a metrophenoth. What is the drainage? So the uh, drainage is through this imperial mesenteric vein, as you can see on this side draining into the portal system. And this is the typical picture, but I'll show in the next diagram how there are anatomical variants, but the important point is that the IMV drains into the splenic vein. So the recta, the, the, the sigmoid, the rectosigmoid, the left colon, all drains. So they may ask you, hey, you do a, a sigmoid augmentation cystoplasty, what's the drainage? And you say, oh, it's the IMV. The other thing is we'll talk about is what is the significance? What happens if you ligate the IMV? Let's say you're doing an RPLND and you have to ligate the uh, renal, I mean the IMA or IMV. What's the collateral blood flow? This is a typical uh, question. So there are lots of IMV uh, variants. You know, the typical one is number one where the IMV drains into the splenic and then the portal. But that's your answer for your in-service exam. But as long as you realize that there are multiple, there, there are multiple uh, anatomical variants uh, where it connects uh, straight into the portal vein, or it's even separate and doesn't drain. So it's just to, to, to important. And why, uh, why should we know this? Well, a couple things that are important are, if you look here, well, two things. One, um, everyone knows, if you go back here, you know, you have your SMV, right? And this is the IMV. But right here on the top, when you come across here, let me show you here, when you come across underneath the porta hepatis, this is the foramen of Winslow, which is important anatomically when you do an RPLND or dissection. The other thing is here's the duodenum and here's the ligament of trites. So it's important when you're exposing things that you know you can take down the ligament of trites here to help with your exposure of a large renal mass. And the other thing is you can take the IMV and we'll talk about that. And that's why it's important to know what the blood flow is. So, so one, you if let's say they ask you a question, they have a big renal mass. It is right in the hilum. What are the things you can do to get uh, a better uh, uh, exposure of the wound? I mean, I'm sorry, of the of the mass at the hilum. And the answer is take down the ligament of trites, and you can ligate the inferior mesenteric vein to expose the hilum. All right, so going, you know, just talking about lumbar azagus and, and hemiazagus uh, uh, system, the, just to know that there's a collateral blood flow. You know, let's say you have uh, IBC thrombus secondary to a big renal mass, and this is causing obstruction of the renal of the vein, then the, well, how is it draining? You know, there must be some way that the kidney is in the lower extremity of draining. And the thing is that there's a, there's a broad collateralization through the hemiazagus and azagus system in lumbar veins. The other thing is, you know, if they ask you an in-service question, you're doing an RPLND and it, you're, 
it, the, there's bleeding or you're having trouble controlling, it's always the lumbar vessels, the lumbar artery, a lumbar vein that retracts uh, into the, you know, the rectus spinae muscle. So yeah, if you're on a guess and they ask you RPL and D, you're having uh, trouble with bleeding, I'd guess a lumbar artery, a lumbar vein. Uh, the other thing is with a renal cell, what is typically bleeding, it's not the arterial bleeding that's the problem, it's the venous collaterals that is the bleeding problem. So that's why you always guess when they say renal cell and you're struggling with the bleeding, I would say guess venous, lumbar veins, or even, you know, uh, depending on where it is, azagous, hemiazagous system. So this is the anterior view and this is posterior view. Just to show you here looking, this is from the, this side is the back, right? So here's the aorta and then here's the hemiazagous and azagous uh, system, but you, you can, and here's a lumbar. So you, you can see how the right side, anyone can do a right-sided uh, nephrectomy. That's a chip shot aside from the adrenal, which is a, you know, a hole in the side of the cava. The problem is the left side. The left side, look, you've got a lumbar, hemiazagous system. You can, all, can have all kinds of problems here. So, so if they ask you any questions about hyalur bleeding, continued bleeding, guess, lumbar, hemiazagous, something along those lines. Okay, let's talk about arteries uh, here. So look, you know, everyone knows that there are three arteries that come off the anterior aorta, you know, the celiac axis, the SMA, and the IMA, and the gonadals come off of the aorta. The important thing here, we'll talk about it later, is, you know, they usually ask you, what is the blood supply of the adrenal? So adrenal is a drainage. We talked about it before, is one, uh, vein, right? whoa, sorry guys, one uh, uh, vessel, uh, uh, one vein, and three arteries, right? Inferior phrenic, adrenal, and renal. And we'll, we'll, I'll show some pictures uh, that's more uh, uh, Ill illustrative. All right. So this is the, uh, you know, the, I like this diagram just to show that you know, you can get into trouble doing a nephrectomy because as you see, here, here is the superior mesenchymal artery, but the left renal vein goes right underneath it. So, you know, they'll talk about, you know, like a patient um, has, uh, a, um, he, lo he lost 40 pounds and he's having abdominal pain and the, the nutcracker effect and pain and everything. And so what it is, is that this acute angle He's got some mesenteric syndrome, so the SMA is compressing the, 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 the left renal vein going underneath. But you can see how if you have a hyalur tumor, there is not much space here. Look, look, one centimeter, man. That's it. And this drapes all the way down, so you can get confused. You can take the cilia, the SMA. I've even heard of people, especially doing a left-sided uh, XGP kidney, where they got lost and they, they took the celiac axis. So it's important to know the blood supply. We'll talk about what supplies the celiac axis. Let's say you take it by accident. Uh, let's say you take the SMA, what do you do? And, then, and that's a, an in-service question that can ask you about what is the blood supply? Well, what happens? Uh, what is ischemic uh, secondary to that? All right. This is just a better cartoon just to show you, this is what it more looks like in terms of adrenal, you know, that you have the inferior phrenic here, you have a branch of the renal. So you can see how the adrenal gland is highly vascular. The other point is they will ask you, it doesn't show here, but I was just thinking about this, that another in-surface exam question is they say a, a patient was in a car accident and he had an adrenal rupture on that side, and usually you manage conservatively, but it's usually on the right side. And the reason is that the intra-abdominal pressure compresses the cava and they have increased pressure and this causes this to burst. And, it, and since the adrenal vein is just a hole in the side of the cava, it causes back pressure. And here it goes along the re adrenal vein, I mean the renal vein, uh, so it doesn't back pressure. 
And here's another good example of how the SMA, look how close that thing is. You can get injure it very easily. Don't be fooled. The reason I drew this picture is just to show more of the, and you know, we say here, oh, three arteries, you know, go to the adrenal gland. But the important thing, I'll show some other images, are there, there are capsular vasculature that comes off the uh, aorta down here and off, off of the renal artery. So that supply the, the renal capsule. So even if you have a complete thrombosis, you can get fooled because you'll see the capsular um, uh, uh, illumination on a CT scan. I'll show some images of that uh, here. Uh, the next thing is just looking at renal vasculature. You know, the typical, you got your segmental and interlobular and arcuate arteries, and this is nice uh, a cartoon of the same thing. But the points are, one, when you, are, when you have a car accident, and patients uh, uh, have an a injury of the vessels, it's usually these interlobar vessels, and these are end vessels, so you have an ischemic infarct. You have a wedge-like defect. You don't, uh, so that's one thing. There's no collateral blood flow. This is uh, end vessels. The second is, when you see a rupture of a kidney, it's usually along the interlobar arteries. So, if you look at the image on the CT scan, these segments, even if you have a big laceration, you know, multiple lacerations, it's always along the interlobar arteries. So these, uh, um, these segments of the uh, pyramids are still uh, illuminated. You know, you, won't, you know all this, so, you know, I won't uh, reiterate, but you know, when you look at a renal pyramid, what's in the renal pyramid, man, you know? It's the collecting ducts, you know, here, are all your tiny little, little glomeruli in the cortex, but what's in the pyramid is your collecting duct. And you know, this diagram you, you all know, uh, you know this better than I do. But the point is they always like to ask these questions about the vasculature, you know, segmental to interlobar arcuate. You just gotta memorize it. I always get from confused. Are they, they always ask, is it the afferent e uh, arterioles? Is it the efferent e e uh, e uh, arterioles? How does the GFR change with, uh, is it the afferent that dilates? So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a simple guy. So one, it's always the opposite that I say. So it's A and it's not a way, it's in. <laughs> so it's always the opposite. I say, okay, it said afferent. Afferent must be into the kidney. Efferent is a way. And all you have to know is that there's a pressure gradient here, right? And that creates your G GFR. So if the efferent is dilated, this dilates, then your GFR, the, what goes across this, it, it, the, the, the pressure uh, uh, across this, is, it goes down, you know? Um, so it's just important to know, uh, kind of memorize uh, this and what's afferent, what's an efferent, because they always like to ask uh, questions about if the e e afferent is dilated or the efferent. So, so if this is dilated, then the pressure decreases. You know, the flow decreases if this uh, dilates. Um, uh, but the, 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 just, just remember that. Okay, next we talk about this, segmental infarcts. Uh, the um, other things that, you know, they, this, you, you all know this intimal tear uh, from a trauma and you get an intimal tear and then you get a, an acute thrombosis. But the important thing is it's, it's just the vessels are inelastic. So you have a tear and the tear causes nidus for platelet aggregation and acute thrombosis. But the more important thing is that if you have complete thrombosis of the artery, you can see here, Here's the air artery, right? Here's the cava. Here's the renal vein coming across. Here's the uh, uh, cutoff sign. But the point is, you can have a cortical rim sign. This is a, a typical, they'll say, oh, here's this CT scan eight hours afterwards. What's your diagnosis? And the point is, we showed the other picture of the, there are a lot of capsular vessels that come off of the aorta, come off the renal artery proximally. So this is, uh, this is to fool you. That that there's a uh, that there's still blood flow. It's not. It's an acute thrombosis of the renal artery. And it's the same thing during the 
the capsular vessels. Look how many capsular vessels there are. Superior capsular, capsular plexuses, middle capsular, inferior capsular. There's a, there's a broad separate blood supply to the renal capsule. This is just diagram showing, you know, the thrombosis. You all know this, I won't waste time. I don't know, I just uh, like this uh, picture anatomically. So, you know, when the patients, let's say you're doing an nephrectomy, right? The patient's in the flank position, then the vasculature is up and down, right? And then you wanna come through here to separate the peritoneum from Gerota's fascia. And the, but look how the SMA kind of curves up. So you, you have to be careful. So it's close. We showed that the diff, this distance between the SMA and the renal vasculature is just one centimeter. You know, they always like to, you know, ask questions, you know, you obviously. So when you're doing uh, right nephrectomy, and they ask you, what's the first thing you come across when you start mobilizing the hyaline? The answer is, is it the IVC? No, it's not the IVC. It's always the duodenum. So you got to mobilize along uh, the, the peritoneal reflection here, open this up and mobilize the duodenum. And then the cava is underneath the vena, uh, the cava is underneath the duodenum and the head of the pancreas, right? So here's first portion of the duodenum, second portion of the duodenum, third portion of the duodenum. And then when it hits the ligament of trites, and we'll talk about it later why this is important, but then it's duodenum, right? So the other thing is, this is portahepatis, right? So this is, what is this called? Foramen of Winslow, right? This is like you're doing an RPLND, or let's say you're doing a big kidney mass and the liver starts bleeding or it has caused a problem. You, you know, your Pringle maneuver here, so you control the hepatic arteries and hepatic vessels go through this. So you can clamp this, right? If you're doing a big IVC thrombus and you have to mobilize the liver and all that business. This is just illustrating what I was talking before about there are lumbars, man. They're gonna ask you a question. You're doing a left nephrectomy. You have some problems, it's bleeding. What is the answer? The answer is always, it's the lumbar veins or, or the azagus or one of those things, but it's always a vein, right? And you can see how, uh, look, you can, get, you can get fooled. And then here's another thing. Look how the SMA crosses in front. You know, if you're off the mark, you can ligate this thing. You're not, you can, not, you're not just a doofus because you ligate this. It's just the anatomy may be all distorted. But here is the problem. Just remember, just lumbar veins, left side of kidney, lumbar veins. We talked about this before, but oh, this is just for an RPLND. But, you know, if you know where the vein goes, you know where the lymphatics go. So if you have a left renal, I mean, your right renal vein, goes into the middle of the cava. So your number one landing site is an interaortal cable nodes. And that's your, you know, your, your, your template. You know your template. The iliacs, uh, you know, I mean the ureter laterally to the, bi to, to it crosses the iliacs. Up here, you preserve the IMA, and then you go up, right? That's your template. And if you know where the renal vein goes, on this side, you're like, oh, goes to the middle of the renal, I mean, the, the gonadal vein goes into the middle of the renal vein. Like, oh, I have a testicular tumor. This must be, this periodic, this must be the landing site, right? So your template is here, you know, preserving above the IMA so you don't bag his, uh, his um, the nerve endings uh, here, you know, where the organ of Zucker candle and all that business is here. All right, well, I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, and this is just showing the same thing, uh, kind of thing. And IMA is always an important site when you do an RPLND, right? So, uh, oh, this is why I, I circled cisterna chyla. So they always ask a question. You're doing an RPLND and they have a big uh, uh, cyst 12 centimeters after this 22 year old had an RPLND and they'll say he had a right-sided template RPLND, and he's got this giant fluid collection. So what is it usually? You bag the cisterna chyla, and it's a uh, lymphatic leak. Uh, so that so 
knowing where the, lymph the cisterna chyla is is important to help you. You know, here's the cava, so it's close to the intraaortic cable dissection below the right uh, uh, renal artery, right? I don't know why they ask these questions, but they like to say, what do the, what is what is next to the kidney? What's on the posterior aspect? Is the eleventh rib, twelfth rib, psoas muscle, quadratus lumborum? They always ask, like to ask these questions. Don't ask me why, and we'll talk about it more. But the point is, this is you know looking posteriorly. But the point is, when you do a nephrectomy, especially I'm mean, saying an open nephrectomy, they say, what's the first muscle you come to? And it's always quadratus lumborum is the first muscle, right? And then you can see how the 12th rib, so when, when you do it off of tip of the 12th nephrectomy, you can see how you can get to the renal hilum, you know? And the psoas in the, and the kidney lies on the psoas muscle, and we'll talk about that more. This is the anterior surface. They always ask these questions, you know, what lies anteriorly? Just memorize this, but you know, descending colon, the tail of the pancreas, you know, you can bag the tail of the pancreas doing an adrenalectomy uh, or, um, uh, or taking the hilum. You know, you have to be careful here because the tail of the pancreas lies right here. The spleen is here, the splenorenal ligaments are here. They just, in the duodenum crosses in front here. So they like to ask this. Don't ask me why, but it's a typical in-service question. So just kind of memorize this picture. And here's another kind of more fancy, you know, you guys will have my slides, so, so you can just look at this. But they always like to ask these questions. What lies on top? What's posterior? What's anterior? Does it lay on the, they'll say, what are the number? Tell us the, the three muscles that the left kidney, um, is posterior surface, and you'll have to say transversus abdominis quadratus and so on, or something like that. I like this diagram just to show you, look, the kidneys lie on top of the psoas muscle, and it's anatomically in an abnormal location. It's not up and down. It's, you know, the so just think of where the psoas muscle, the psoas muscle goes out like at a 30, 45 degree angle, right? But if the top of the kidney sits on the top of the psoas muscle, then this is more lateral. So what is closer to the kidney surface? You know, what's the, you know, let's say you have a kidney stone, the stone to skin distance, you know, they talk about the, the, the distance of 10 centimeters or more, right? So what's farther, whether you can do as well or not, to the F2, you know, but what is farther away? The upper pole is farther away. So when you do a perk stone, if you just know the anatomy and that the this is lying on the muscle, that's why we put the, the, the perk in the lower pole because the posterior calyx, right? Can't get to an anterior calyx through a perk. You, the, post, the kidney is in this direction. Here's the skin. So it's easy to put it through the posterior calyx, but the lower pole, because the lower pole is closer to the skin than the upper pole, you know? And then we always talk about, you know, if you, what if you go above the, the 11th uh, rib, you know, we talk about the increased incidence, 20% pneumothorax, you know, like, all right. Don't ask me why, they love to ask these <laughs> questions you know, anatomically where the muscles are, what are you going through? All right, so just to re reiterate, when you make a flank incision, you know, you got your external oblique, internal oblique, and your transversalis muscle, then your transversalis fascia, and then your peritoneum. You got your gerotus, right, fascia that surrounds the kidney like a bag, and then you got your peritoneum. So when you do nephrectomy, you come through this space, right? And there's always some preperitoneal fat. I call uh, this. Uh, this always annoys me when I do. A, if you ever do an open nephrectomy, this is all. <laughs> this uh, this kind of fat is here when you take it off. But regardless, the point is the first muscle that you come to is quadratus. Always the quadratus uh, muscle, and we'll talk a little bit uh, 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 further about the importance. You know hands in pocket, you know, the external oblique is hands in pocket, the, the trend, uh, and, and, uh, and the like. Okay, I'm not gonna go through this, just memorize this. 
This is for your in-service exam. You can take this from my slides. The reason I have this is, what is Petit's triangle? So here's Petit's triangle, right? Or Petit's uh, triangle. So here's the latissimus dorsi, ex external oblique, and the iliac crest. And you know, in the old days when they would have a patient with a uh, an abscess, uh, a, nephrec a kidney uh, would pus out, they make an incision here and drain the pus. But the important point is, the reason why I'm saying this, is it's an in-service exam. The superior lumbar triangle is where you make a dorsal lumbotomy incision. So they'll say to you, you make a dorsal lumbotomy incision in this adult to remove his stone. I don't know if we do it anymore, but regardless, it's a question. So the point is right here. So you come here off the latissimus dorsi, you open up. This is the lumbodorsal fascia, the transversalis fascia. So if you so you make an, a, an incision here off the edge of the erecta spina, I show later. You come here toward. Uh, you get on the fascia to the quadratus, and then you open this space to get when you do your, your dorsal lumbotomy. And I'll show a different incision here. So here, here's a nice diagram showing you. You make your incision, right? And you get down to your por posterior lumbar dorsal fascia. And then you open this up and down. And, it's and then the fascia is shaped like a Y. See the Y here? And here, so you open this up, lumbar dorsal fascia, and then you open up the fascia along the quadratus lumborum. So the first muscle you come to in the answer, you did a dorsal lumbotomy, quadratus lumborum. Then you retract the quadratus lumborum, but then they always ask this question. What nerve did you injure doing your, your dorsal lumbotomy? The answer is always iliohypogastric. That's your answer, right? It's right there. Iliohypogastric is there. A little inguinal is here, but this is what you usually injure. And this is just show to illustrate. They like to answer this. So, so, so here it is, lumbar dorsal fascia. You, you, uh, you know, the latissimus is, is, is retracted away, but you come here, your Y, you come uh, here on, on your, your erectus spinae muscles, paraspinous muscles, and then you hit the quadratus lumborum, and then you, you, you enter your space. Okay, of the lumbar dorsal fascia there. All right. And this is just illustrating that if you make your, here's the kidney, but you make your dorsal lumbotomy, it's always iliohypogastric. That's the right answer. Right? And this is just illustrating, um, you know, that look, the intercostal nerves run underneath the ribs, right? And, um, the intercostal nerves run, you know, all the nerve endings, what does it run through? You know, it runs between the transversalis uh, fat, uh, <clears throat> and the uh, uh, internal oblique, right? So that's why many people will say, when you close your incision, don't close the transversalis and close just the externally, otherwise you trap the nerve. So all these nerves run through this, uh, uh, the same layer, right? They run between the transversalis and the internal oblique. But the point is, so you have, you know, your 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, but then you got your iliohypogastric, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal. So this is, you know, if you make your dorsal lumbotomy, you can see how you can bag your iliohypogastric. Uh, same thing. This is just to illustrate that, you know, the, the intercostal, uh, nerve and artery and vein are right on the inferior uh, aspect uh, kind of thing. And I don't know if I have a diagram of it, but you know, the if let's say this is a 12th rib and this is the 11th rib, the pleura inserts on, I usually say on the 12th rib on the medial one third and on the 11th rib on the medial one half. So if you're going to take the rib, either you have to peel off the pleura or you're going to make a hole in it right? Uh, on the 12th rib, you can take three, uh, two thirds of it and you won't even hit the, the pleura uh, here. So that's, uh, uh, all right. 
they like to ask this lumbar plexus questions and you'll just have to memorize. But the important things, and I'll show some other diagrams to this effect, is the lateral femoral cutaneous, you know, is usually injured uh, when you're doing a, a, a node dissection for an aggressive node dissection for penile cancer, right? Your femoral nerve is injured doing a psoas hitch or a, a retractor injury. Genital femoral is also can be injured during a psoas hitch, right? And it's sensory and obturator during a, a node dissection for like uh, bladder cancer or, or the lot. But you, you just got to memorize it and know what segments there are, the lumbar segments. And this is just a diagram showing you just got to memorize this. That's all. Know that genital femoral is a sensory, is a sensory and, and what they all do. I'm not going to belabor this. You can look at my slides. Uh, this is just kind of mnemonic eye golf, you know, just to remember the nerves of the lumbar plexus and what they come from, you know, L1 to L2. You, you just got to memorize this. Uh, same thing. What they all supply, uh, you just got to memorize this. They usually like to ask, Ilu hypogastric, ilu inguinal, genital femoral, femoral obturator uh, kind of thing. Um, they usually don't ask these. They do like to ask pudendal nerves uh, as to the, you know, the S2, the S4. Uh, they like to ask that. Um, but you can memorize this. I won't uh, read this. All right. The next thing is, I like this if. You know, when you say, oh, he got a perineal nerve palsy, he was in an autonomy position, ah, he, he can't dorsiflex his uh, foot, he can't uh, evert it, ah. So what does that really mean, you know? So <laughs> what it is, is look, here's the fibula, uh, uh, fibular head, and here's a common perineal artery. So, I mean, the nerve. So what happens when you're in a lithotomy position, the nerve is on stretch because your legs are in lithotomy. And then this presses against your your Allen stirrups or whatever. So you get a nerve palsy and you can't, so they always ask this. So if you got a superficial perineal nerve injury, if you can't evert your foot, if it's a deep perineal, you can't dorsiflect or toe extension, you just got to memorize it. And then the typical, typical of a dorsal per deep perineal, you, you, you have a uh, can't feel between, you loss of sensation here between the first and second toe, and then common perineal lateral uh, aspects of the, the leg. But th that's the key. Uh, dorsiflexion, toe extension, just memorize that. And it's way up here. It's always uh, at the, uh, from the positioning. All right, they love to ask that. And this is, I like this. Someone sent this to me um, from the Twitter sphere. But it's a nice summary by uh, someone from Spain. But the point is, just memorize this. Just memorize this whole two pages. This is great for the for the in service. You know, iliohypogastric. It's they'll tell you it's the dorsal lumbotomy. Ilioinguinal. You're doing some kind of you're doing an orchiectomy or you're doing a hernia repair. Genital femoral. You're doing a psoas hitch or boari flap, and you bag it, and it's a sensory uh, nerve problem. Lateral femoral cutaneous, this is a penile cancer node dissection uh, kind of thing. Obturator nerve, uh, you're doing a node dissection for uh, uh, bladder prostate cancer. Femoral is a deep bite that you take during a psoas hit. Common perineal, patients in the lithotomy position. Pudendal nerve, you know, the, the running joke, you know, S2 to S4 keeps the penis off the floor. So, uh, that's uh, so, so, you know, it's good for erections. It's, it's important for the external sphincter. Um, know this too, memorize this. Cream hysteric is L1, L2. Bobo cavernosis makes sense that's S2 to S4 because that's the pudendals, right? Anus, S2 to S4. Bobo cavernosus reflex, S2 to S4. Uh, and then memorize these, uh, the uh, bladder physiology, penile physiology, just memorize this whole page. That's great. I, I like this. This is a nice take home for you guys. All right, adrenals. I'm going to go fast because I'm like going to run out of time. But, you know, celiac access, we talked about this, three arteries. But this is what it really, the, you know, 
that sometimes it's a big, it's a hole off the posterior lateral aspect. Sometimes it's very close to the kidney, sometimes it's far away. Sometimes the, the adrenal vein is long, but it's posterior lateral, that's the point. And it's got three arteries, one vein we talked about, but this is what it really looks like. It's really got an extensive vasculature. So it bleeds. You know, if you come and you're doing some laparoscopic nephrectomy and you cut a piece off of this thing and it's bleeding, it, it, it's, it is really highly vascularized. Look how many arteries go to this darn thing. So that's why um, many times if you do a partial adrenalectomy, it continues to bleed and you have to take the whole darn thing. But look how many, uh, where the inferophrenic renal and, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, inferophrenic uh, off of the aorta and then renal. All right, aorta. So this is a favorite in-service question. You know, yeah, I, I, you know the, it's got three layers. It's an outer longitudinal, middle circular and inner longitudinal muscles that make up the aorta. But the key is, that the middle and distal ureter have all three of these letter, layers, but the proximal ureter does not. It, it has a poorly defined inner muscle and a poorly defined outer longitudinal. So it really only has middle. So, so, so they'll, they'll ask some question like, oh, the patient's having a ureteroscopy and you perforate the ureter or you avulse the ureter. Uh, off of the, uh, off of the, uh, I'm sorry, they're, they're, they're harassing me here. Uh, sorry. All right. Um, so, um, do you perforate the UPJ and, or you avulse the UPA? And, and these are the reasons because it has a poorly defined outer, uh, uh, outer and inner longitudinal muscle and only has a middle circular. Just memorize it. All right, just, just to show, you know, the ureter, you know, and obviously, you know, it comes under, I'm sorry, here. So, so the vas deferens crosses, you know, over the ureter here, and, and, then, and then this crosses, the ureter crosses over all these uh, vasculature. But the point is, and I'll show another image, that up to about the iliacs, all the vascular comes medi uh, 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 medially off of the aorta. And then once it gets into the pelvis, it's coming off of the internal iliacs, right? And you can see how the vas deferens is an uh, important anatomical landmark as it comes out of the external ring and goes across down to the some you know medial I mean lateral to the <clears throat> medial to the seminal vesicles here right and this is just a nice uh, diagram showing what the blood supply is you know majority of it comes off the aorta a little less uh, to the, uh, the the gonadal vessels and then a lot of it comes from the renal and then you can see how a lot of, a lot of it comes from look inferior vesicle uh, uh, superior vesicle, internal iliac uh, blood supply, and it's all coming from, so this is medial, this is from lateral. And this is more illustration. Look at this. Look how uh, highly vasculature. This is why you can cut the ureter and do an end-to-end -end anastomosis, right? Because you've got all this collateral uh, blood flow from up and down. I mean, this is just nice to look at. I don't know, this is just to say that if they ask you some kind of injury question, you know, this is, uh, if it's a lower third, usually the answer is a psoas hitch with below the, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> if it's below the iliacs and if it's above the iliacs, usually do a UU or a Bori flap. TUU is always the distractor. That's usually not the answer. Don't, don't say that. Okay, I'm gonna skip this, you know this. So this is a point just so that said, you know, you have your, wait, wait, let me look here, the medial aspect of the psoas muscle on the very medial aspect here, you have the genital femoral. But if you take a deep bite, really deep, and you do a transverse bite, you can injure the femoral uh, nerve inside the psoas muscle. So that's why we always say when you're doing a psoas hitch, never put your suture like this <laughs> as they show in the diagram, do it up and down 
So you're less likely to strangulate or, or ligate the vessel, I mean the vein. And then two, they ask you, oh, the patient has a femoral nerve palsy after your surgery. It's because the retractor was, the blade was placed on top of the psoas and it compressed the femoral nerve during the surgery. That's a, that's a very common uh, question. Yeah, so, you know, you injure the general femoral nerve, uh, sensory nerve, anterior thigh. It's commonly lost. You know, the, the psoas minor tendon is not always there uh, to so, so to, and they like to ask this, that you're going to ligate the contralateral superior vesicle arteries in order to bring the muscle, I mean, bring the bladder over to the contralateral side. That's a, okay, we talked about this, but this is just showing you how they say, oh, the patient had a nephrect, you know, uh, a, a prostatectomy or, or a cystectomy, and then he's got a femoral nerve palsy. Or what's 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 the injury? What nerve is injured? What and and you can see nicely how the femoral nerve can get injured. I don't know. This I don't know why I put this here, but this is just to show that when you do a Boari flap, in general, lap any kind of flap you do is three to one ratio, right? I, I think of that for all flaps, muscle flap, skin flap, boy flap. I don't like to make the flap any longer than three times its width. So if you make the very pedicle at the bottom four centimeters, then probably the maximum you can make it is 12 centimeters. All right. To you, to you, you, you know all this contraindications. You don't want anything. You you infect the other system, so that's why you don't do a TUU because if you have you know tuberculosis, cancer, stones, then if then it will infect this system. But the point is, it's important when you bring the kidney across. I mean the ureter across. You don't. You bring it supra IMA or it's super long that it doesn't get nutcrackered here under and kinked underneath the IMA. So this is an important thing. And so the other thing that they'll, they'll ask you about TUU is one, you don't mobilize the recipient side. Uh, you only mobilize the, the donor side, you know, the ones that you bring across. This you leave in situ and you have to make at least a two centimeter ureterotomy and make sure it doesn't get kinked underneath the IMA. That's another in-service exam. All right, pelvic anatomy. I'm, I'm gonna run out of time. Okay, I'm gonna skip this. You know this all. Um, this is just to show, you know, is, uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that uh, is here, the, uh, the posterior branch, first branch off here is the superior gluteal. Here's the internal iliac. And these are end vessels. They'll talk about this later. But, you know, when you have a pelvic fracture, what gets injured and what needs to be embolized are the end vessels. So it's the pudendal down here, you know, going through Alcox Canal. Here's pudendal. And the superior gluteal. And here's superior vesicle, inferior vesicle, internal pudendal. Okay. I like to think of this. This is kind of, you know, you need to memorize this. Branches of the internal iliac. You can, you can look at the slides, but I like to think of it this way, that it's a, two groups of three branches. Two, two groups, one off of, here's the internal iliac, and then you have branches to the bladder, and that's superior inferior vesicle. They go to the rectum, which is the middle rectal, and then if it's a woman, the, it's the uterine artery. Then you have an end vessel here, that's the internal pudendal, right? And then you have the obturator, and then you have the superior inferior gluteal uh, arteries. These are the branches off the, and then you just gotta memorize this. This is just, they, they like to ask this, what are the branches of the <laughs> posterior branch? What are they? Just re regurgitate this. What are the branches off the anterior branch? This is, and just regurgitate this for your exam. And this is just showed nicely. I like this just to show that these are, you know, you got the anterior branches, but the posterior branches, right? You got the iliolian lumbar, you got the lateral sacral, and the biggest one is this, you see the main one here is the superior gluteal. 
you know so if you um ligate the internal iliac artery you know you can see how you can get butt claudication and butt ischemia because you're you're bagging the superior uh, glute, uh, gluteal artery this is also an end end vessels the superior gluteal but they'll, they'll ask you what's the first branch off of the posterior branch of the internal iliac and this is this is the main and and uh, this is it the superior gluteal the other thing is here's the pudendal vessels going through Alcox canal, right? Alcox canal. Here's the pubic ramus, right? The inferior pubic ramus, Alcox canal. But it goes underneath the iliocoxygeus muscle. Don't ask me why. They like to ask this. All right. And then you can just memorize what this is. And I know this diagram is 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 bad. I got this off the internet, but here's the point. So here is the internal iliac comes through the lesser sciatic frame in the pudendal vessels underneath the iliocoxygeus muscle. And then you'll see here, there's a, a branch off here. Here's the inferior rectal uh, uh, artery. And we'll talk about why, why am I mentioning this, you know? And here's just to show that and I have other diagrams showing how the, the branches are, you know, inferior gluteal, and then it branches off to inferior rectal. We'll talk about that. And scrotal arteries and the like. I'm going to run out of time. So. <laughs> so you guys know this. I won't belabor this. But it's important to know where a node of cloquet is, uh, a circumflex veins, you know, the margins of the dissection of the circumflex. Here's your node of cloquet. So if you know, so the most post, the most, caudal dissection of your pelvic node dissection is here and here's node of cloquet right but it's the same one if you're doing an inguinal node dissection for penile cancer the most cephalad the most caudal is node of cloquet but from the penile cancer side from the inguinal the most uh, cephalad is also node of cloquet right all right and this is important i'm not going to belabor this but i just want to keep going uh, the reason I, I, mean, I have this picture is just to show where the peritoneal cavity is, how the space of retius is, can be a big space here, you know, and how when you have an extra peritoneal bladder rupture, the fluid spreads way up, it can go up to the umbilicus, so you can get fooled on imaging, and then an intraperitoneal rupture, you know, from like a car accident is usually a six centimeter hole. And that goes into the intraperitoneal uh, cavity. So let me show, and this is just showing you a, you know, a laparoscopic hernia repair, but look how big that space has been. The other point is, where is the extraperitoneal space? Where's the intraperitoneal space? So it's just important to know that here's the retroperitoneal space, but there's, it's a big, you know, things can spread along the transversalis fascia up high, and I'll show why this is important. Okay, so here's just CT scans showing, you know, an extra peritoneal bladder rupture, but you can see how it fills the space of retius, so that's why you know it's got the molar tooth sign here. Again, space of retius. You, you, we saw how big it is and how it can dissect all the way up to the umbilicus. The other thing they like to ask you Okay, so space of retius, blood fluid in the space of retius, extra peritoneal. But the key here is, do you see fluid in the cul-de-sac? They always ask you. They say, "Oh, patient was in an accident." They show you this image, and they don't show you anything else. And you're like, "I don't care. I can't tell what the hell. There's no injury." But you can tell because there's extra vesicle uh, contrast in the cul-de-sac. That means it's intraperitoneal. So they'll just show you this image and you'll say, oh, this means intraperitoneal because I can see fluid in the cul-de-sac. All right, I'm gonna, and this is in the collar gutters, you know, it fills out uh, intraperitoneal and the difference intraperitoneal, molar tooth sign, prevesical space, extraperitoneal. All right, bowels. All right, sorry, I'm running out of time. <laughs> uh, so, and you guys can just look at my slides, but the important thing is they'll ask you, you know, that 
the here is you know the the SMA is supplying the right call and it's supplying the appendix. So if they say what supplies the 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 mace or the metropinov, it's the SMA. It supplies all your small bowel. The SMA. Um, uh, 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 the, here's the IMA supplying the left descending colon, and here is your watershed area where there's there's uh, um, communication between the two. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, you know you have uh, uh, art, marginal arteries of Drummond and collateral blood flow, and this is the watershed area. The point is, sorry, is memorize this. This is for your in surface exam, and they will ask you you know if you take the IMA. What is supplying the rectum? You know, you do an RPLND and you take the IMA. What's the answer? The answer is you got middle rectal and inferior rectal are supplying your rectum. That's why your rectum doesn't die, right? And you got collateral blood flows from taking this. And just memorize this. Here, and here's the answer to your in-service exam. And just know what supplies what, because they'll ask you funny questions like, you do an ileal conduit, and the ileal conduit dies. Uh, what was the blood supply? SMA or whatever. All right. And then memorize the venous uh, drainage. It's, it's fairly similar, but the same thing. You got middle and, and inferior rectal, and and this is why a patient, you know, has a IVC thrombus. I mean, uh, and collateral. You, that's why they have hemorrhoids. You know, because there's back pressure here. But just memorize this in terms. Can you take the IMV? You know, they'll say, oh, you're doing an RPLND, and you take the IMV. Where's the collateral blood flow? How does this colon drain and it's draining through the middle and inferior rectum. That's the answer to when you did your RPND. And here's just a diagram showing you took the IMV and here shows that the these blood vessels, the left colic is out, the sigmoid is out, the superior rectal is out, but the middle rectal and inferior rectal are still present and able to drain through the marginal arteries here, uh, marginal veins the, your colon. That's why it doesn't die. That's why you can take the IMV. And this is just to show the, the you know, doing an RPLND, you know, you mobilize the colon along the root of the mesentery. What does that mean? That means you're mobilizing the white line of tault all up to the foramen of Winslow, right? Over here where the port of hepatitis is, and then along the, the root of the mesentery up to the gastrojuvenal junction, ligamented trites. Um, you know, I was going to skip this, but the point is that the lesser sac, this space between the greater omentum, the transverse uh, omentum, the transverse colon in the stomach is where the, the pancreas lives, right? And I'll talk about this later. I'll skip over this. They like to ask, on the insert exam, if you're doing um, um, uh, an mental flap, what side should you base it on? And the point is that the it's based on the gastroduodenal vasculature off of the uh, celiac axis. This side is a bigger artery. It's twice the size of the left side. And there's not always collateral communication here 10, 20% of the time. So the answer is, if you're doing a mental flap, you take the right, you base it on the right gastro, uh, uh, gastro I mean, the uh, right gastroepiploic based off of the gastroduodenal artery because the, it's bigger and you'll get an ischemia. And this is just to show you the. Uh, you got to ligate the short gastrix. You got to leave an NG tube. You uh, uh, there's an avascular plane. But the point is, you take it on the left side. There could not be good collateral blood flow, and you get ischemia. Um, I'm going to skip this. We talked about this. This is a nice thing when they say about trauma. Uh, if there is a trauma. And they say, how do you get control of the vessels and blah, blah, blah during a trauma? So the constant anatomical marker is the ligamented trites, gastro, uh, the, the, the uh, duodenal uh, uh, junction, and the aorta is always medial to the IMV. So if you can see the IMV, so they'll ask you, what is important? And they say, 
the aorta lies in between the ligament of trites and IMV. That's an in-service exam. The other in-service exam that I ask you is, you know, where is the, it's tricky to get to the right renal vein, the artery, the right renal artery is intra-aorta cable and it's high. It's, it's up, it's not as, as so easy uh, as on the left side. Hey, Alex, are you still there? Alex? Yep, I'm still here. And, uh, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I can go quickly. Uh, what, what should I end? What should I do? Um, if you want to go for another 10 minutes or so, that's totally fine. Um, okay. We still have 48 people tuning in. Um, okay. You know, I don't want to... Okay. Too long, but yeah, if you want to go for 10 more minutes, that's great. 10 more minutes, and I'll just go quickly through the slides. Perfect. Okay, you guys all know this. Just memorize this. What's pseudified, so stratified, columnar, bulbar. But this is the point of this image is when you do a urethrectomy for penile cancer, this is a different area, right? This is stratified squamous. So it's not usually involved in your transitional cell. Uh, urethelial ca uh, cancer. But just know what, what's what, that it's eccentrically placed in the bulb. This is important. Just memorize this. So the point in point is that they always like to ask, here's the bulbospongiosis. I'll just go quickly, but you can look at my slides. Bulbospongiosis, issue cavernosis, transverse perineal, superficial transverse perineal, central tendon, um, uh, perineal body. This is more proximal, but the, you know, rectal urethralis comes to the external sphincter, and then that's, uh, here's the external annual sphincter, puborectalis, pubococcygeus, iliococcygeus, obturator internus, gluteus maximus, uh, um, anal coccygeal ligament, and they like to ask these questions. What's connecting to the central tendon? What's, I mean, what connects to the perineal body? And here's a woman, here's a man. This is just nice to memorize uh, kind of thing. So they, they, they always ask this. So they'll say, what inserts into the perineal body, perineal membrane, denombius fascia, and the pelvic? And just memorize this. What into, inserts into the perineal body? Uh, what muscles? All right. If they ask you questions about the genitalia, it's always superficial external pudendal is usually any kind of skin of the penis, the scrotum, anything on the anterior aspect is always superficial external pudendal. So that's always guess that. If you, they ask you anything about the perineum, I don't care what it is, Singapore flap, uh, Martius flap, anything about the perineum, it's always internal pudendal is your, is your answer. This is showing, oh, they, you did a pupusial onlay flap for a hypospadias repair. What is the blood supply? Superficial external pudendal. That's all. It's always the answer. This is just a. I'll skip this. I'll skip this. And just know that the blood supply of the urethra is uh, fairly extensive. You know, you got your, you know, your pudendal to common penile, dorsal artery, the penis, lots of collaterals to the central cavernosal, urethral, bulbar arteries, and you got collateral blood flow. And this is why you can do a urethroplasty. I'm going to skip this. This is just to show that here is Alcox Canal, pudendal uh, vessels come in here, but you got an extensive, this is where, you know, the dorsal arteries of the penis, the scrotum, to the bulbospongiosis uh, uh, go, and just reviewing, you know, issue cavernosis, transverse perineal, uh, central tendon to the perineal body. They like to ask this. Uh, we talked about this before, but you know the sacral nerves go uh, through the lesser sciatic foramen, then they go through. I lost my uh, through Alcox Canal, and then the anatomy, the nerves and arteries go to the same place. But you got all this nice blood supply: dorsal artery of the penis, central cavernosus artery, bulbar artery of the penis, scrotal arteries, and the like. I'm gonna skip that. I'm gonna skip this. This is just to show that, you know, I usually like to think of this, this retrocrural uh, uh, plexus, uh, coronal plexus, uh, as it's trifurcated. It's, there's one, two, three, you usually see, but the point is, it's usually one artery, right? 
two veins. They don't show it here, but there's two veins, one artery, uh, and it's a plexus of nerves, but there's, there's complete collateralization of the blood supply uh, here of arteries in circumflex veins here. And you'll see these vessels and they usually like to ask, where the layers does it run through? So it, it's deep to Buck's fascia, right? And on the uh, uh, tunica, of the virginia of the, the penis. And then the drainage is to the cavernosa, uh, cavernous uh, veins, but we'll skip this. I'm gonna skip this. Oh, here's a famous uh, uh, question. So they'll ask you, uh, some guy has a, a, a penile fracture or they show this hematoma, and then you'll say, oh, this is a tear, but the Buck's fascia is contained because the hematoma is contained within the penis. This is a classic in-service exam question. And then they'll ask you, oh, this is what it looks like. And he's got this butterfly rash because this means that the Buck's fascia is open, the blood can go through Buck's fascia and then spread along Kali's fascia. Kali's fascia is Scarpa's fascia. Scarpa's fascia or Kali's fascia inserts into the medial aspect of fascia lata, and that's why you have this butterfly rash. So they'll say butterfly rash, I mean, butterfly hematoma means Kali's fascia is, is intact, Buck's fascia is disrupted. They, as I said before, they like to ask, oh, what's the blood supply of Mardius flat? So it's a pudendal thing. It's in the perineum, right? So if they ask you anything about perineum, you always say internal pudendal. Um, and the blood supply is dual, but it's primarily internal pudendal, but there's also an external. It depends where you take the pedicle from, but it, you know, there's a ex, it's, it's got a dual blood supply. It's got an external pudendal coming up from top, and an internal pudendal coming from the bottom. So uh, it's highly vascularized. They usually like to ask, what is the blood supply of the vas deftus? Don't ask me why. But it's usually superior vesicle is the answer. And here's a diagram to show uh, that it's the, your in-surface exam. So you, you just say, what's the blood supply? Superior vesicle, just memorize it. Femoral triangle, uh, I won't belabor this, but the point is that when you're doing a node dissection, it's a lateral femoral cutaneous. If you do a big Desler node dissection for penile cancer, just know the margins here. You know, Sartorius, adductor longus, where, where's the nerve, where's the artery, where's the vein, where's the saphrofemoral conduction. But it's the superior medial aspect that where Cabanus's node is, you know, for penile cancer, right there, man. And then when they ask you what's the most cephalad aspect of the node dissection, it's node of cocaine, right? This is just showing the same thing, but, uh, you know, penile cancer, fossovalis, you know, you do a limited node dissection, but you, if you know the anatomy, you know, you know the drainage, saphrofemoral junction, medial superior, cabinous is node, you don't go lateral to the fossovalis, that's a limited node dissection. If you go lateral, what do you injure? Lateral femoral cutaneous is your in-service exam question. And you know you preserve the saphenous vein if you do a, a limited dissection. But the other point is that here in this fossa ovalis, you know, they talk about superficial and deep nodes. Here's a deep node, man. It's in the fossa ovalis right here. And the, what's the lateral margin of your dissection? The femoral artery, right? Uh, and here's another nice diagram of the uh, fossa valis and this uh, some other pictures I want to do. Here, this, I like this. Someone sent, sent me this from the Twitter sphere. Just memorize this and regurgitate it for your in-service exam. Uh, just memorize this. They like to ask these questions. All right, that's it, guys. And then there are, I, I put another 30, 40 questions. I took this from all the old in-service exams. And... Uh, uh, it's all on anatomy, these in-service questions. So just uh, sh share my slides, uh, Alex, with everyone. And they're, they're like, all these questions are from like 2005 through the, through the present. And they're all anatomy questions, kind of thing. All right. That's it. I'm done. I, I don't want to keep you guys any longer. Plus, they keep calling me from the hospital, man.
Yeah. Dr. Brandis, that was amazing. Thank you so much. We will definitely uh, distribute those uh, questions to Yeah, yeah. If they, if they just take the slides and they just memorize the last ones and then, then take the questions, because these are all uh, based on anatomy. These are all uh, in-service specific. Yeah. Every year, there are a ton of uh, anatomy-related questions on the in-service and boards. And I think your your tip of just say internal pudendal anytime anything about the <laughs> has definitely gotten me points on every single urology exam that I've ever taken. So that yeah. take put put that one in your pocket and keep it for later, everyone. Very good. Uh, well, anyway, thanks again, Dr. Brandis. That was a super duper high yield talk. Exactly yeah. what this uh, uh, series is all about. Uh, cool. We really appreciate you taking the time to go through everything with us. Uh, I'm sure. Tons of people will be reviewing this video before the exam and um, we'll distribute those slides for sure.